All right, I'm going to do one thing real quick. I accidentally left the camera on all day. So. <laughs> it says it'll run 10 hours, but sometimes it lies. So I'm going to plug it in. Because I know I've got people, I know I've got people watching tonight on the live stream uh, that submitted questions. Um, if you want to, go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 41 beginning will be our first question under consideration. Matthew 12, 41 and 42. And I'll read you the question as, as it sent to me in just a moment. Just want to go ahead and get this. Get this camera plugged up. I pulled a brandy and knocked it off. Knocked it off the wall. Only some of us know what that means. will rise up in judgment. I'll go, let me just go ahead and read it instead of trying to give it to you from memory. It says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. And, and the person who asked the question puts the question in the right context, no saying this. The overall point of the verses is that the word of God was listened to and acted upon. But the question is, what judgment do these verses or to what judgment do these verses refer? In other words, what is, what is the judgment under consideration? And it says, how will they rise at the judgment? And so there are, there are two, two questions. What is the judgment under consideration and how will they rise at the judgment? I'm going to answer the second one. I'm going to answer the second one first. I think that it's a very, and I think both the questions are, are pretty straightforward in the way that I'm going to answer them. Uh, I believe that they'll rise at the judgment in the sense of what Jesus said in John 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So what does that tell us? It tells us that everybody who's ever lived and died will rise at the judgment. So Jesus, and the interesting thing I find in this case is that Jesus was talking to the present generation uh, and implying that they would all be dead. <laughs> At least there seems to be that implication. But also that uh, those that had lived, for example, uh, the Ninevites and the Queen of Sheba that had lived a thousand years before, they would also rise at the judgment. So everybody's going to rise at the judgment. Uh, Job confirmed this in uh, Job 19 when he said, If a man dies, will he live again? And then he answered the question in the very next verse. Uh, he said that, uh, that uh, God has a desire to the, for the work of his hands. And he said, I will rise. He said, I will see him with my own eyes. And so there are a number of passages uh, in the Old Testament that indicate that everyone will rise uh, in the judgment. And so I think that's... That's the, the statement, they will rise at the judgment. Also connected to this would be uh, the after, kind of the afterthought uh, of a refutation of premillennialism you know, that says that some will be risen at the so-called rapture and others will be risen a thousand and seven years later at the general resurrection. And yet Jesus uh, speaks of everybody rising at the same time. Uh, and I think in the case of the men of Nineveh, he's talking about people, I think he's necessarily talking about people 
who were saved. Because the Bible says when Jonah preached to the city of Nineveh, they all repented in sackcloth and ashes. In fact, that the, that the king of Nineveh commanded that even the animals take, a, take a, 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 an appearance of uh, repentance. In other words, they put sackcloth and ashes on themselves and on their beasts as a, as a, as a show of repentance. And so uh, that would indicate to me that, that people both saved and lost will all be raised at the same time at the judgment. Um, you know, uh, Revelation 20 and verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Uh, and so everybody will stand at the judgment. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. So I think, the, I think the, the question about rising at the judgment just means everybody will be raised together at the one and only and final judgment of all mankind. Then, now to go back to the first question, it says... What judgment do these refer to? And again, I believe it's the judgment of all mankind. And then, you know, how would you know how would they how would they judge these? See, the question is: the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with, with this generation and condemn it. So. The question then becomes, how will the men of Nineveh arise and condemn these people? And how will the queen of Sheba arise and condemn these people? Now, what does it mean that they will condemn these people? Open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And as you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to look at, at uh, the first, it'll be, in, it'll be uh, couched in the first eight verses of this chapter. And the, the answer, I think, is couched in the first eight verses of this chapter. And what I, what I believe to be the case in the statement, will condemn it, I believe is figurative. It is figurative. Not that the men of Nineveh will rise up and, and point the finger at all the Jews living in Judea in the first century, or that the Queen of Sheba will rise up at the judgment and she's going to point a finger at all the Jews that were alive in the first century. I believe it's a figurative statement in, in so far as that they will be held up as those who did what they heard and knew to be right. In other words, that the men of Nineveh heard the preaching of God and they obeyed it. The Queen of Sheba, you know, basically in, in their minds, went halfway around the world to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and one greater than Solomon is here, and, and you won't listen to him. And so, so it's, a, it's a figurative statement speaking about their actions con, will condemn those at the judgment. And here's how it, it's going to, I'm going to see it in two senses, okay? Note in 1 Corinthians 6, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1, it says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? Now, note two things that, that Paul says to the church at Corinth. Number one, the saints will judge the world. Number two, the saints will judge angels. Now, how do we reconcile, how do we reconcile that, with that with that statement I've already mentioned? We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And again, I think it is, a, it is an illustration or a figure insofar that in the judgment, surely there will be men who will claim that they couldn't hear the gospel, they couldn't obey the... In other words, all types of excuses might be held up uh, uh, as to why people didn't obey the gospel. Uh, think about um, uh, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. There's going to be claims. You know, Did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many wonderful works in your name? Well, Jesus is going to say, you know, depart from me, 
I never knew you, ye that work lawlessness or iniquity. But at the same time, he will be able to point to Christians and say, these people did what I said. These people did the will of my Father who is in heaven. You also had that same opportunity, and rather than doing what they did, you pursued your own, your own will, your own devices, the, the doctrines and the commandments of men. Well, then how are we going to judge angels? And which angels, then which angels will it be that we will judge? I believe it's the fallen angels. I don't think there's any judgment for the angels in heaven. I believe that Christians will be held up as an example to angels that sinned. For example, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into chains of, of uh, uh, darkness. Uh, to be reserved unto judgment, uh, First uh, Peter chapter two and about verse four or five. Then you have Jude, uh, where Jude says the angels that kept not their first estate were cast out of heaven. So how will Christians judge angels in the judgment? Those angels are going to be judged. Now how will, and and by what or what might one of the means be by which they can be judged? God can say to the angels, you had it in heaven. You were in heaven. You were in the very pre you were you were in my very presence and were unwilling to be faithful to me in the pre in my very presence. And yet these flesh and blood beings, never having been in my immediate and literal presence, through their faith, did exactly what I told them to do. And they endured temptation. And that they endured the temptation that was sourced in the same source as your temptation, the devil. The devil tempted you. You couldn't be faithful even though you were in heaven. The devil tempted them on earth, not being in my presence. And don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not minimizing the word. But he might say, and having nothing more than the word and not my actual presence, they were able to be faithful. And so the lives of Christians will be held up as judgment against the world and as judgment against the angels that sinned. Let me give you one more passage. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I want you, I want you to look at verse 7 in this same context of judgment and condemnation. Hebrews chapter 7. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he did what? Condemned the world. Did Moses condemn the world? Did, did he actually condemn the world? No, but his obedience to God condemned the world. In other words, God can hold up Noah as an example of here's a man who was blameless and upright in his generations. Isn't that what, isn't that what the Bible says about Noah in Genesis chapter 6? He was upright in his generations. Uh, I think in the King James, maybe the word is perfect in his generations. Obviously, we know it doesn't mean he was sinless. But it shows us the uprightness of Noah and that Noah was able to live an upright life and raise his family to live upright lives in a world that had gone totally into rebellion against God. There was nobody left on the planet that was faithful to the Lord when God called Noah. Conservatively speaking, there were likely a billion people on the planet at that time. What we don't sometimes understand is that one about one-third of all human history is tied up in the first six chapters of the Bible. 1,656 years between Genesis 1 and Genesis 6. Now you multiply, well, let's just say one, at least one-fourth of all human history. If you, if you multiplied 1,650 years by four, uh, you'd get about 6,600 years. Okay, and, and those of us that believe the Bible account believe the earth is about 6,000 
or so years old. So somewhere between 25 and 33% of all human history is tied up in those six chapters. Which means people multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and living vast amounts of time. Conservatively speaking, there could have been as many as a billion people on the planet when God sent the flood. And all of them, the Bible says, their, their thought and intent was to only do evil continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, the life of Noah held up against the world that, that had rejected God. And then Noah's obedience in building the ark was further proof that he had faith and obedience toward God, also condemning the world. And so when the question is, how will the men of Nineveh and the queen of Sheba condemn or, 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 uh, yeah, condemn, uh, or judge this or that generation, I believe it's by example. By example, by the same way that we'll judge the world, by the same way that we'll judge angels, and by the same way that Noah uh, uh, condemned the world uh, in which he lived. And so I think that, that's the best way I know how to answer uh, that particular question. All right, the second question that I have and, uh, is, uh, let's see, I don't think I got it. Yeah, I didn't get it printed off, but I know what the question is. It said, please explain, and, and I've, I've had to deal with this through the years, um, dealing in, um, uh, not here at Burleson, I am just mean in general, where you have Bible classes in uh, churches or Bible classes in uh, vacation Bible schools, um, and you've got a nine, you know, you've got a nine-year-old boy who's been baptized but he's got to go into the teenage class because he's been baptized and the people teaching the nine-year-old, the woman, or the person teaching the nine-year-old is a woman. Now, by the way, that happens in our area all the time. All the time. That a, that a boy will be baptized and then immediately he has to go to a class that has to be taught by a man. Now, what... You know, what text is there in the Bible that teaches that? Well, the answer is none. What is the text that is misused to teach that? Well, that'd be 1 Timothy chapter 2. And so we'll read that passage together. By the way, there's nothing inherently wrong in that practice. All right, let me just be clear. Uh, if it was a violation of somebody's conscience, I would, I would certainly allow somebody to pursue their conscience, or if there was a, a lady teaching the 9 and 10 year old class, or the 11 and 12 year old class, or you know, whatever, and, and there was a baptized boy in that class, and she didn't feel like she needed to teach him on that account, I would never condemn that, again, based on a matter of conscience. I just don't think it's necessary, and I don't think the Bible demands it, okay? So while I would say it's permissible, I don't think it's required, all right? And so in 1 Timothy chapter 2, you find in verse number 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And that's the verse, that's the verse that's always cited in defense of that practice, you know, and there are a couple, for me, there are a couple of, there are a couple of issues with this, but the primary one is, there is nothing about immersing a nine-year-old boy that makes him a man. There's nothing about immersing a 10 or an 11 or a 12-year-old boy that makes him a man. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that a 9 or 10 or 11-year-old boy has in common with a man is a Y chromosome. Yeah. You, know, you leave him alone and he lives long enough, he'll end up being a man. But he ain't a man. Not you know, not by any, not by any measure, not by any measure of the word. Uh, he's a male, but being a male doesn't make you a man. And so I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's what Paul had in mind when he wrote First Timothy two and verse twelve that a woman couldn't teach a nine-year-old, you know, a nine-year-old baptized boy. You know, think about this. If I was baptized when I was nine years old, and let's just, let's just say that my parents divorced before I was nine. They divorced when I was about 12 or 13. I, I can't remember the year. I think it was 1980. Um, 
But let's just say they divorced before I was nine years old. All right? And then I was baptized when I was nine years old. And I'm still living in that house with my mama. Does my mama have any religious religious authority over me? Wait a minute. Not if I'm a man. What if I'd been nine years old and told my mama, you can't tell me nothing, I'm a man. Got my jaws boxed, that's exactly right. And rightfully so. And rightfully so. So, you know, being, you know, being baptized at a young age does not confer manhood or maturity on an individual. And so, again, I want to be clear. Because I have, because I've taught, I mean, literally I've taught in oh, hundreds of vacation Bible school classes in this area. Hundreds. If you count every day as, as an individual class. I've taught hundreds of Bible school classes in vacation Bible schools in the last 25 years. And, and I have had young boys in my class on that account. I've never, I've never questioned it. I've never criticized it. You know, I've never encouraged people not to do it, but I never believed it was necessary. I never believed it was necessary. But again, if somebody wanted to, to pursue that for conscience sake, I would never stand in their way. Because again, it's not something that has to be done or not done. It's something that's up to the conscience of those uh, who are involved. And so I would never want to violate someone's conscience on that account. All right, I got a third question. I did get this one printed off. And um, I appreciate this one. This one actually I think came in through our, uh, through our Google voice uh, number and, and text. It says, Must we get every doctrine right and be in full agreement on every teaching in order to remain in fellowship with one another? And then the, there, actually there are, there are three questions. That's the first. Second question is, how can we tell if something is a fatal error? In other words, be lost for teaching it or believing it. And then third, how should we treat brethren or congregations who are not consistent in fellowship? All right, let's look at, let's look at the first question. Must we get every doctrine right and be in full agreement on every teaching in order to remain in fellowship with each other? Um, the answer is no. The answer is no. Open your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 14. Look at Romans chapter 14. Start reading in verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. He who does not eat to, uh, to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And then uh, it goes on to, in verse uh, 14, it says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, that passage, that particular passage, verse 14, coincides with what Jesus said about purifying all meat. He says, not what goes into a man's mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of his mouth defiles him because what come out of, comes out of his mouth originates in his heart. He says, but what goes into a man's mouth 
then goes into his belly and then is eliminated basically into, you know, into the waste. And Mark's account says, thus Jesus said, purifying all foods. In other words, under the Christian age, under the Christian age, no longer would catfish and pulled pork be off limits for God's people. You know, Jews could not eat any fish that did not have scales, neither could they eat pigs. But when Jesus purified all foods, what did he do? He allowed the eating of catfish and the eating of pork. Then in Acts 10, in Acts 10, in the example that God had accepted the Gentiles, what example did, did God use? Clean, clean and unclean things. And what did Peter say? I can't eat anything that's unclean. And what did God say? What I have cleaned, you should not call unclean. Happened three times. Now, that is a... That example just shows us that God had already purified all foods and was using that as an example to Peter that God had also purified and accepted all men, which would have included the Gentiles. Then you have 1 Timothy 4 that says that, that everything is sanctified by God and fit to eat provided it's received with thanksgiving. All right, so, so we have a number of examples here in, in Romans 14 and also 1 Corinthians chapter 8. That, that teaches, that, teaches that, that all things are lawful for us to eat. But the conscience of some does not permit them to eat. You know, you can imagine a, you know, a, a Jewish man, that was, let's just say you got a Jewish man that's 80 years old and he becomes a Christian. And he ain't never eat a, he ain't never eat a bite of pork in his life. You know, are you going to try to convince him to eat pork? Or are you just going to, are you going to respect his conscience and not serve him pork? That's what Paul's getting at. You know, it's, 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 it's lawful for him to eat pork, but if it violates his conscience, he shouldn't do it, and you shouldn't encourage him to do it and violate his conscience. We say, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, what if you, con what if you converted a Muslim? Because Muslims don't eat pork. Would you encourage a Muslim to eat pork? Or would you respect his conscience and let him not eat pork? So, and, and to him it would be a sin for him to eat pork. And so what Paul says here in Romans 14 and also what he says in 1 Corinthians 8 is there are some things that are left in the matter of judgment, but they fall in the matter of doctrine. In other words, some doctrines fall in the matter of judgment in the way that they are carried out. You know, whether or not a person can eat or not eat is a matter of doctrine. How they choose to observe that is a matter of judgment. So when I say we don't have to agree on, doc on every doctrine, that's what I'm talking about. That there are some doctrines that are, that are given to us, that are given to us, uh, wherein there is leeway or judgment or expediency to be, uh, to be uh, uh, exercised. Um, and, and, and so, in that in that sense, no, we don't have to agree on every single on every single doctrine. All right. Uh, secondly, how do we know if something is a fatal error teaching? Now, this is a difficult this is a difficult question. Now, let me give you the last paragraph to the question. All right. Many brethren fellowship or use teachers at their schools or lectureships that they disagree with on a host of issues from things like the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, preacher training schools not being under an eldership, disaster relief groups not under an eldership, uh, family life centers, <laughs> i.e. gymnasiums, uh, elder reaffirmation views, Social drinking, children's church, Christmas, women translators, uh, hand clapping in worship. And so, you know, there's a, there's a host, there is a host of things listed here. Some of which I believe, some of which I believe are matters of doctrine that we have to agree on. Most of them are matters that we don't have to agree on. Now, just as a, just as a quick aside, 
Is there anybody in this room that ever heard about the elder reaffirmation doctrine? Anybody? I didn't think so. It's something that arose 20 years ago or so uh, uh, by, by a very sound and faithful gospel preacher. And he just simply, he just simply made the statement that an eldership appointment is not necessarily a lifetime appointment. You know, and, and I agree with that. You know, if, if, elders, you know, if elders are to be selected by the members, or if elders are selected by the members, then if a man ever lacked the qualifications to be a leader in the church, I think the church has a right to ask that man to step down. You know, if it ever became, you know, if it ever became a problem, and I said this from, from, the, from the very time, from the very time my name was brought up, that if it ever became an issue for me to serve as an elder, I'll step down. You know, if it became an issue for the church, you know, not for just one old sorehead, you know, but for the church. I, and I might even step down for a sorehead just to make, you know, if it was that, if it was that big of a deal. So, you know, none of it, you know, you know, I would I would intend to serve as long as I was able to serve, but there might come a time when I'm not able to serve, and I think the church would have a right to ask me to step down. And I think that'd be true for Lynn and Philip and John, but I think particularly for me, given the, the position that I have. And so I don't think I don't think it's wrong for churches to reaffirm their elderships. I think it can be a good thing, uh, but that again, that's a matter of expediency. Because there's nothing in the Bible that tells us how to appoint elders, and there's nothing in the Bible that tells us how to get rid of elders. So those, those are matters that fall in the realm of expediency. So you know, if a church wanted to pursue something like that, that would, be up to, that would be up to the congregation itself. Matters like the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I don't know, look, I don't know anybody that holds that as a matter of fellowship. Uh, whether or not the Spirit only indwells the person in the Word, or if the if the spirit spirit has some type of literal uh, indwelling, so, you know, so long so long as uh, again, so long as we're all in agreement that that indwelling does not uh, does not uh, permit or or uh, in, induce the performing of miracles, I think we can all get along, and and we have managed to get along on that account for for a long long time. Uh, you know, some some people may be more adamant about that than others. Um, Let's see. But things like, for example, you know, I'd have a hard time accepting anybody that wanted to endorse social drinking. And I mentioned that this morning in Bible class. You know, the Bible doesn't have anything good to say about alcohol. And it has a whole lot of bad things to say about alcohol. And there's, something, there's just something about the phrase, come over to my house and we'll have a beer and study the Bible together that just doesn't seem to roll off the tongue that well. You know, the, you, see, y'all are laughing, right? But I told you, and, and, and Kevin confirmed it this morning in Bible class, that there are churches in Memphis, and I'm sure there are other places as well, that, that permit, don't discourage or permit the, use, the social use of alcohol at, at their various gatherings. And so, but, but I'd have a hard time with that because the Bible says you've got to prove all things. You've got to prove to me that it's good, that it's a good thing. And I believe, you know, as, as the preacher I used to work with in Paris, Tennessee said, uh, the, uh, the, the, the drinkers have many defenders and no, but no defense. <laughs> many defenders, but no defense. In other words, you got, you know, a person is obligated to show me that a thing is right. You know, it's not just the matter that, that I believe I can show that it's wrong. You got to show me that it's right. And, and so on, on that account, you know, I think there are some things. Um, yeah, I'll just throw another one out here. Uh, the children's church. Um, you know, year, in years gone by, I would have probably been, and, I, and I, I, look, and I'm not in favor of it now, but I think it falls under the matter of what an eldership wants to do. And, here, and, here, and let me tell you what really, what really moved my thinking on this. That when I went to Ghana, West Africa, I went to Ghana, West Africa, along with some guys that were hardcore anti-children's church. But when they got to Ghana, guess what the Ghanaians do during worship service? 
They take all their kids and put them in another room and try to teach them while the adults are in a worship assembly. And one of the reasons for that is, is that when you have congregations like in Ghana that are in the middle of big cities, that a lot of these parents take their kids and they send their kids to church on Sunday morning to get them out of the house. Maybe even get them a bite to eat for breakfast if they're serving you know, some, maybe some fruit or some plantain or something. And so you've got, you know, you've got 50 or 100 kids basically off the street. Do you want 50 or 100 kids off the street sitting in your worship assembly on Sunday morning and their parents are nowhere to be found? Or do you think it's probably a pretty good thing to get them in a, in a building next door? You know, and there was one congregation where, I wor- where we worshipped. They gathered up all the kids and it was a giant auditorium. The auditorium was bigger than our entire building by a pretty good piece. They rounded up the kids and they all had to sit, as we said, Indian style in the very back of the auditorium. And there was four or five women running around that had about five foot long sticks. And those children were, were told and expected to sit there and be quiet during the worship service. And if they didn't be quiet, them women would whack them kids with a stick. Yeah, that might not be a bad idea. Kath is all for it. Did, did you need a stick when Kyle was growing up? She volunteered, she volunteered to hit Kyle with a stick. Um, that reminds me of the nuns, how they used to take their rulers and stick. Smack a hand, that's right. But, uh, but my point is, is that in the United States, these guys were hardcore anti-children's church. Then they got 6,000 miles from home and, and saw that there was a completely different situation than the one that they were accustomed to in the United States. Now, and they probably went back to the U.S. and were still anti-children's church, but endorsed it here. I'm not saying that's inconsistent. Well, I'm, but it'd be inconsistent to say that it's a sin if it's over here, but not a sin if it's somewhere else. You might say, well, it's not nece- you might presume that it's not necessary here. Matter of expediency. You're not for it, but you can't condemn it if you don't go condemn it 6,000 miles, you know, if it's a sin here, it's a sin there. And so there are just, there are just so, many, so many things that we have to be careful about uh, when we start talking about matters of fellowship. Um, you know, I think the Bible is clear on a number of things. The Bible is clear on, on, well, I know the Bible is clear on what a person has to do to be saved. The Bible is clear on how the church is to be organized. The Bible is clear on the, the items of worship. Uh, the Bible is clear on, uh, on male leadership uh, in, the, in, the, in the work and worship of the church. Um, when people digress from such, they need to be encouraged not to do so. And we need to, we need to bear with people as much as we can. But, but at the same time, there, sometimes there does have to come a point where we say, look, we can't, we can't be a part of this. We can't, you know, we can't hold hands with this. We can't extend the right hand to fellowship uh, on this matter. But not as a knee-jerk reaction, but rather as, as the result of forbearance, patience, love, and dialogue. And if a church is intent on leaving the faith, and the Bible says that churches can leave the faith. If, the, if they're intent on leaving the faith, then that can be recognized. But it doesn't need to be the knee-jerk reaction, the knee-jerk reaction to somebody uh, doing something that we don't, that we don't think uh, is, uh, is uh, scriptural. Um, I think Christmas falls under that uh, matter as well. The church, the church has no business celebrating Christmas, but I think in the passage that we just read in Romans 14, it'd be permissible. You know, it's permissible based on, based on personal liberty. One man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems every day alike. You know, whether or not you want to celebrate Christmas is your business. Whether or not you want to celebrate your birthday is your business. Uh, the Bible doesn't speak to those things. And so, uh, and so we have to be careful. Uh, there, are, there are things, you know, how do we determine? Well, it's a difficult, how do we determine what, you know, what is a fatal error and what is not? Well, it's a difficult thing. Um, but 
how will I say this? I think we do better to err on the side of caution than we do on the side of on the side of being reactionary. I think I think that's always a uh, a good way to pursue it. So uh, that's a difficult question, but I'm thankful. You know, I'm thankful for it. Um, yeah, I, uh, nothing in the list is you know groups that are not under uh, groups that are not under the uh, uh, direction of an eldership. Yeah, I'm not in favor of. You know, there was a disaster relief group at one time in Nashville that was under a, an eldership that was not very far from where Ron and I lived. Then they incorporated themselves and got completely away from that from that church and the eldership and assigned themselves to a board of directors. I didn't think that's right because they're doing they're doing the work of the church. And if the, if a group is doing the work of the church, it needs to be associated with a church. Uh, Herald of Truth was the same way. Herald of Truth was a work of the Highland Church in Abilene in the 50s and 60s and for a long time. And But then it left the eldership and became an entity unto itself. And on top of that, it began to hire and send out missionaries. Well, when did God, you know, when did God ever permit some corporation to hire and send out missionaries. You know, never did. You know, whose work is that? It's the work of the church. You know, when, when Saul and, and Barnabas were sent out, they were, they were affiliated with the church at Antioch. And when it came time to send them out, the Holy Spirit didn't speak to Paul and Barn or Saul and Barnabas. The Holy Spirit appeared to the church and said, Separate to me, Saul and Barnabas for the work that I've appointed them to do. And what was the first thing they did when they got back from that first journey? Went right back to Antioch and reported all the things that they had done to the church. And so, you know, there, when, when groups attempt to supplant the work of the church, um, that's a, to me, that's a problem. And that's why we always have supported the church at Lake Jackson in their disaster relief because the eldership, and it's on their website, this work is overseen by the eldership of the Lake Jackson, Texas Church of Christ. And so we know, you know, we know this work is being overseen by an eldership. Uh, I found out, Big Boy called me the other day. There's, there's a group working out of uh, Decatur, uh, Flint, that area up in there around Decatur, Priceville, uh, disaster group. I didn't even know they existed. Uh, I would assume they're under the, the oversight of one of the congregations up there. It might be, you know, might be the uh, might be the Decatur Church, which used to be Austinville, or it might be Flint, might be Pri I don't know, but I would assume that that work is under the oversight of one of those congregations and is supported by other congregations in that area. And so, uh, but they're they're doing a work under the oversight uh, under the oversight of an eldership. And so. Uh, you know, those types of things, I think, uh, fall under the realm of, is, is this the work of the church? And if it is, then, uh, then it needs to be overseen. It needs to be overseen by the church and, or by an eldership. And so, uh, it, you know, I think, each, I think each thing stands and falls on its own. In other words, I don't think there's any blanket way to, uh, to deal with these things. So um, I know it sounds somewhat confusing. It says, how do, last question was, how do we treat brethren or congregations who are not consistent in fellowship? Uh, I'd just say treat them the way we'd want to be treated if we found ourselves in the same, in the same boat. You know, if, if, you know if, we think somebody, if we think somebody's doing something wrong, then we, you know, we need to approach them. You know, if, I, if, you know, if I'm doing something wrong, I'd hope somebody would, would approach me and, uh, and, and speak to me. And... Uh, and so, you know, that, that's the only way I know how the, the Bible's not clear on how to deal with that. Uh, but I think, you know, I think that that's, I think that's the approach that Christ would use. It's the approach that Paul used. I mean, man, you know, how many errors of the Corinthian church would we tolerate in a local church today? I mean, just start, just start walking yourself through the book of 1 Corinthians and think about all the errors. People, people that denied the resurrection of the dead. A man had his father's wife. I mean, man, you want you want to talk about? There's some serious stuff going on in Corinthians. 
Now, Paul didn't ignore it, but he didn't write them off either. He, he corrected them. And then he wrote another letter, you know, as, as a follow-up letter. And so, and so, you know, Paul dealt with them, you know, Paul dealt with them as one who obviously had helped establish that church and helped it grow. And that's the way I would want to deal, that's the way I would want to deal with others, and that's the way I would want them to deal with me. All right, any questions or comments about any of that? I had another question I was just going to introduce, and I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there because we won't have another session for a couple of weeks because next, uh, next Sunday night is singing night, so we'll be in, all, uh, be in the fellowship building. Uh, but the question is, uh, many Christians, and by the way, I'm not answering this tonight, or I'm just throwing this out so you can be mulling it over in your mind. Many Christians believe that America was formed out of some type of divine providence of God, but America was established in rebellion to their government. Many of those same Christians say we cannot rebel against our present government because that would be a sin. Said Our own founders expressed approval to rise up against tyrannical leaders should such arise in our own government. So isn't it hypocrisy to attribute such rebellion to God himself? It says, uh, um, you know, can, and the question is ultimately, can we rise against our government and still be right with God considering our founders encouraged us to do this? And so, and so there, therein lies the question, what is the Christian's responsibility to government? And can Christians, uh, can Christians rebel against their government and still, be, and still be right with God? Now look, those are not two simple questions. Those are two multifaceted, very, very deep questions. And I want you to think about those things over the next, next couple of weeks because we're going to talk about these things. All right, and I'm going to guarantee you. I'm going to guarantee you one thing: we will not all be in agreement on this. All right, I can guarantee it because we're going to talk about this. We're going to discuss it. And we're going to talk about what the Bible says. For example, in Romans 13, in 1 Timothy 2, in 1 Peter 2, in Ephesians chapter 6. You know, we're going to look at what the Bible says, and we want to try. We want to try to come to at least some type of understanding uh, on this matter. But I can just, I can all but guarantee we're not all going to be in agreement on this. Uh, but I want us to be thoughtful about it. But most of all, I want us to be biblical about it. We want whatever con conclusions that we draw uh, to be based in the scriptures and not in that. Uh, not in the stars and bars, rebel flag, redneck blood that flows through most of us, because that's the easiest way. To, that's the easiest way to determine what's right. And by the way, tell Dennis to watch this if he ain't watching it, because he's one of the first ones I thought of when I got that question. All right, so you too, Kyle. You just go back and watch it again. All right. Any questions? But we're going to talk about that's that's going to be our that's going to be our discussion in two weeks from tonight, Lord willing, is the question about the, the Christian and his responsibility to civil government. All right, any other questions? All right, I really appreciate everybody being out tonight. I know it's nasty weather, and uh, I think there's some storms may still be be brewing. So everybody, please be safe tonight.